a working class person would never get away with doing what Boris Johnson does at PMQs. You know, he turns up or used to turn up with his tie halfway up his chest, you know, half untucked, his hair looking like a, an exploded haystack. You know, can you imagine a working class person turning up to the dis- dispatch box looking mm. like that? They'd be torn to bits in the press. But this speaks to our innate um, worship, in a way, of aristocracy in this country, that we think that they can do no wrong. And we've got to kind of like train ourselves not to think that. I mean, we've been given plenty of evidence in recent years why that isn't true and why the aristocracy is actually using that position to both further its own ambitions and spread um, deeply divisive politics. Hello, Sam. Hi. Sam is an investigative journalist who is joining us today to talk about his book, Bullington Club Britain, which I thoroughly enjoyed. I'm glad to hear it. As you can see, I've actually broken the spine. <laughs> I was Sorry. Say, it's really, really We should have made those better. It's based on the Bullington Club. Do you want to explain what that is? Yeah, so the Bullington Club is this um, exclusive elitist society at the University of Oxford. It's only open to sort of the sons of air, the, sorry, the heirs to fortune and fame, um, so no women allowed. Um, and it's infamous for the conduct of the members of the club who go to the local um, pubs and restaurants and generally trash the place. Um, they behave pretty appallingly. They dress up in you know, the aristocratic um, garb and basically play the fool. Um, and yeah, the book is basically an analogy of this. Of course, Boris Johnson, David Cameron, George Osborne were all former members of the Bullingdon Club. Um, but the book is an analogy for how they acted when they were part of the club, trashing restaurants. That mentality has basically seeped through to government and they've ransacked the nation, they've trashed the nation, they've treated us all like they do, um, you know, the, the silverware and the staff um, who serve them at these restaurants in Oxford. So that one of the initiation processes for getting into that club is burning a £50 note. Allegedly. Allegedly. Allegedly, yeah. The strict rules of omerta, so secrecy around the club, mm-hmm. uh, which I think speaks to its sort of privilege and exclusivity. Um, there was a brilliant film, actually, you've probably seen it, The Riot Club, that came out a few years ago, which dramatised and perhaps exaggerated um, what goes on in the club. But in the film, one of the, the members is sort of, the blame's pinned on him for one of their nights of debauchery where, you know, they trash a restaurant and beat up a, a pub landlord. Um, they pin the blame on one individual and then uh, a, f- a current cabinet minister comes to see him the day after and says, don't worry, old chap, we'll sort you out. Right. And that's kind of the, the premise that no, no matter how badly you behave um, within this club, you'll always have mates in high places. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what we've seen during like, the pandemic and the post-pandemic years as well is, you know, corruption, arguably, um, certainly cronyism, um, jobs for the boys. <laughs> um, and we've seen those who've broken the rules rewarded with public contracts, for one, and millions of pounds in jobs for speeches when they've left high office. So what's Boris Johnson made now in the few months since he's left Downing Street? Five million quid. Nice. Nice, yeah. yeah. Well, all the, you know, the rest of the country has to suffer with the aftershocks of COVID and the cost of living crisis. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, that's the Bullington Club mentality. But it's not uncommon to earn money after you've been prime minister. A lot of them have done it. David Cameron, Theresa May, they earn big money through mm. speeches. The one person, and you actually note this in the book, is Gordon Brown. He doesn't take that money for himself. He does do speeches, but he feeds that back into his own charity. Is mm. that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And so, he doesn't, importantly, lots of these politicians have sort of, you know, their own either private companies or their own charities, but they derive income from those outfits, whereas Gordon Brown doesn't derive a single penny from his own charitable organisation. Mm-hmm. All the money that he earns goes to worthwhile causes. But yeah, like you say, the, the kind of common theme of modern British political history is not just prime ministers earning a lot of money, but 
you know, ex-cabinet ministers as well. I mean, we've seen the sting from Led by Donkeys in the past few days where, you know, Kwasi Kwarteng, ex-chancellor, is asking for £10,000, was it a day that he was asking for? Um, and so this, this, this whole sense that no matter how badly you behave in office, um, you'll get rewarded when you leave, it sort of gives an air of impunity because it doesn't really matter what you do. It doesn't matter if you serve the public well or not you're going to be able to load your pockets up mm. with cash when you've left. And yeah, that's, that's a fundamentally broken system that's punishing the British population, and not those in power who behave badly. But what's important about that is that they're not doing anything wrong. We actually allow that. That is the system. Exactly. You are well within your right to go and charge £10,000. It might have even been an hour, I think it yeah, it was. Hancock, wasn't it? it? Was. Yeah. yeah, it was. Ten thousand yeah. pound an was. hour. You're well within your right to do that. Yeah. I mean, and that is part of the problem, I, I, I would say, isn't it? So you were talking about the expenses scandal, and how you know that was a pivotal moment for democracy. That landed us with we're now able to do freedom of information requests, which supposedly means that government is more transparent and we're allowed to, you know, see in a bit more about what these people are up to. But actually. Because MPs now can't take money off of the public purse, they're now turning to second jobs and these £10,000 <laughs> consultancy jobs. But I mean, it, is that a problem, do you think? Yeah, I think, I think it's a massive problem. It's a, it's a problem, one, because you have the distraction of MPs. They're not serving their constituents. I mean, you know, you and I probably know a lot of people, a lot of staff members in Westminster whose jobs require an immense amount of time and I feel desperately sorry for them because they're basically having to put up with the nonsense and often the abuse that comes from their MPs not taking their job seriously and you've got the caseworker who's you know sorting through the problems of local constituents who's working 50 60 hours a day and he's paid nothing as Lee, Lee Anderson liked to, <laughs> liked to point yeah. out um, and then you've got the MPs swanning off doing second jobs it's, yeah, it's a fundamental distraction. And I think there's a very fair point to be made with, I mean, take Lee Anderson as an example. He's taken a £100,000 a year job at GB News, which pays him more than his job as an MP. So which is his primary occupation? I think, I think, that, I think you know, there's certainly a question as to whether that distracts MPs, but I think um, more fundamentally, like you say, we've had a series of political scandals over the past like what 20 years now you know we've had the Iraq war we've had the financial crash we've had the expenses scandal we've had coronavirus we've had um, Owen Patterson and Chris Pincher and we've had Partygate and so by an MP saying oh I'd rather earn a shed load of money for a private company rather than serve my constituents that is further dragging democracy into the dirt at a time when faith in Westminster is at an all-time low. And I think it's just, as a result, on that just basic point, it is, yeah, it's something that MPs should avoid as much as possible. And they're not. They seem to be throwing themselves into it. I mean, since 2000, from 2019 to 2022, MPs earned £17 million pounds from outside employment. 15 million by the governing Conservative Party. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's perfectly within the rights of the population to be like, why? But then an argument that could be levied at that is, well, we need to attract the best and the brightest into Parliament. And do the best and the brightest want to serve the population for £80,000? Or is it, you know, are we attracting the right people by saying, look, you can earn millions on the side? Mm. Well, I mean, you just have to look at the calibre of our MPs and ministers over the past few years to kind of, you know, appreciate um, how false that argument is. I mean, we've got such a deficit of talent in the highest offices of power. Um, and I think, actually, very directly, this sort of insider trading system um, where you become an MP and then you get a job you get a job as a result in in the private sector mm. that kind of attracts the sort of person who's only in it for their own personal financial enrichment um, rather than what it is which is about public service um, and I think there's certainly you know 
a very legitimate conversation to be had and one that just isn't had at all within the political parties about how we select MPs. Like, it's based on those who can fund their own campaign. So you basically have to be rich to start off with to actually become an MP. And then it attracts those who want to, it seems, line their own pockets or play world king, Mm -hmm. like Boris Johnson. And, you know, that has essentially broken our politics for the past 15 years. And we need to call the parties out and say, you know, do something about it. And I guess this kind of lends itself to what you're talking about in the book about plutocracy, right? So wealthy people are able to profit from people in high office who are making uh, the decisions for them, Mm. which is innately not good. Yeah, well, yes, exactly, exactly. And it's sort of like plutocracy is the neighbour of oligarchy. So you've both got, in a plutocracy, you've got those in high office who can make money by virtue of their professional standing as, you know, a a minister or an MP. Um, And then you've got those who sort of orbit those in high office. So you've got the political donors, you've got... um, I mean, to be honest, you look at the way that the Conservative Party has manufactured itself in recent years, and it's basically... Um, built a system whereby those who donate to the party get access to Mm. ministers. So the leaders group, if you donate £50,000 a year, you get access to what's called the leaders group, whereby you get meetings with Liz Truss and Theresa May and you get to play tennis with Boris Johnson. Um, They have their annual summer soiree um, where you can wear... I think there was like a... Was it a a crystallised version of Rishi Sunak's head or something or you know it's like really something you'd want in your home something, yeah exactly exactly or you know a speech with Theresa May you know so you can have a nice nap for half an hour you know that sort of thing is auctioned off for like hundreds of thousands of pounds mm. um, but yeah these tennis matches are auctioned off there as well and then even more shockingly during the pandemic the Sunday Times exposed um, an insider uh, Downing Street network where the highest value conservative donors um, were allowed into briefings, Downing Street briefings with senior officials and where they could put their perspectives across to those in power. And that's just very directly a system where power is being influenced by money. Um, that's not, that is a fundamental corruption of democracy. It's an old boys club. Um, and yeah, like the book says, that is, that is the sort of rotten heart of the Bullingdon Club um, ethos. And also, I suppose, the, the rotten core of Johnson's premiership, because what was sold to the public in 2019 was this is the man of the people. Mm. This is the man who's going to deliver for the quote unquote red wall. Hate that phrase. But you know, for the purposes of this conversation. This is the man who is, who understands your needs, but actually not at all, because he's, what he has been doing, and there's proof of that, is he's just been helping his wealthy friends get wealthier. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, a few stats to throw out there. Um, COVID contracts during the pandemic, three billion pounds worth of COVID contracts were awarded to friends and donors of the Conservative Party. you know, you saw this during the public appro- uh, appointments process as well, you know, um, mates of the regime being appointed to lead, you know, very core um, parts of the COVID response. Um, we've seen with the BBC board what exactly has happened, you know, a Tory donor and a former Tory advisor being on the BBC board. Um, like you say, throughout Johnson's tenure, he broke that fundamental promise to be a people's government. Um, And like, to lots of people that's completely unsurprising because like we've tracked Johnson's career and life probably more intimately than any politician in recent memory. Like he has been a national fascination. But like you say, through the process of Brexit, the Vote Leave campaign, the 2019 election, he sort of cleansed his image in a way. He separated himself from the Conservative Party. Partly as well, he was kind of a cultural figure rather than a political figure. You know, he'd been on Have I Got News For You. He leverages his humour in a way that accesses people in a way that no other politician can. He's sort of an intentional, bumbling idiot, right? So people don't see him as like the old Etonian, former Bullingdon Club 
man that he is. You know, he's cut from the same cloth as David Cameron. He's more elite than Rishi Sunak, even despite the fact that Rishi Sunak is the wealthiest per person ever to have been prime minister. Um, and we saw that, you know, that, that um, sort of inner identity of Boris Johnson come to the fore in exactly how his government behaved during the pandemic. Um, and I mean, an interesting um, fact is that um, it would be interesting if you can find the, the clip of this documentary uh, where Boris was, was, was um, approached with this fact. Apparently, whenever um, he comes into contact with a former Bullingdon Club member, Boris runs up to them and goes, Buller, Buller, Buller. Right. You know, the sort of primal chant of the Bullingdon Club. Um, Isn't he also known to have, you know, what is it for the silence that they have, the secrecy? Murder, Hasn't yeah. he been known to mutter that as well? Yeah, whenever he's asked about the Bullingdon Club, he goes, I'm murder, I'm murder. Right. I'm murder, because that's the whole idea that the Bullingdon Club protects its own. And Johnson hasn't got rid of that. I mean, he said that, you know, the Bullingdon Club was an, a mistake. You know, it was, um, I think he said it was toffishness and twittishness, um, typical Johnson phrasing, which uh, sounds like it means a great deal, but actually means very little because he just replicated that mentality when he got into Downing Street. Um, so yeah, mm. he very much practices the, the Bullingdon Club code even to this day. So he went from this small circle inside Oxford where it's all secret and they're helping each other out and he's just basically brought that into public life. Yeah, basically, basically. Um, yeah, I, I, wrote a, I, I read a beautiful phrase which was, um, Boris Johnson went from smashing up restaurants in Oxford to smashing up the nation. That's effectively what's happened. Well, wow. So he uses Latin to be evasive to make himself seem that he, well, that an illusion that he is talking about something quite grand when he's not at all, right? Yeah, exactly. And he's uh, admitted, he was at a, uh, a Latin-themed charity event, which, again, uh, I, 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 you know, that's not the sort of thing that I've been invited to, ever. No? I don't know about you, Ava. Um, <laughs> but at this event, or after it, I think, he admitted that uh, Latin words are intentionally evasive because they sound as though you're speaking with great intellect because you're referencing something that very few people know, but you may actually be talking complete nonsense. And I think actually this kind of like, this is something that I really tried to get across was that these people are sort of educated in the art of uh, linguistic distraction. It's the same with Jacob Rees-Mogg. He talks in grand phrases and throws in references to you know classical literature but if you boil it down to its essence it's still the same reactionary populist divisive nonsense and um, that the likes of Nigel Farage is spouting and in, in many cases even people further to the right of Nigel Farage think it has a deeply corrosive effect on democracy because we're kind of taught instinctively to trust these people, to trust people who um, you know, are members of the aristocracy, who talk well, who you know, are well educated. Um, and yet they're using that to spread a really poisonous ideology. And so they're basically getting away with it. Um, I've always said that Boris Johnson would never get away with, sorry, that a working class person would never get away with doing what Boris Johnson does at PMQs. You know, he turns up, or used to turn up, with his tie halfway up his chest, you know, half untucked, his hair looking like a, an exploded haystack. You know, can you imagine a working class person turning up to the dis dispatch box looking mm. like that? They'd be torn to bits in the press. But this speaks to our innate... Um, worship in a way of aristocracy in this country that we think that they can do no wrong and we've got to kind of like train ourselves not to think that i mean we've been given plenty of evidence in recent years why that isn't true and why the aristocracy is actually using that position to both further its own ambitions and spread um deeply divisive politics well you call it a sycophancy right so uh, that's also come about through him just being ubiquitous i suppose as you said, he was on Have I Got News For You and we got used to kind of this like lovable, well, affable character. 
And even in the way that we refer to him, I mean, he's known as Boris. Mm. What other politician do you call by their first name? Yeah, what's his full name? Alexander Boris De Feffel. De Feffel Johnson, man of the people. I understand what you're talking about, how they are so posh and so educated and they use this Latin to, you know, make vast waste of the population think that they are cleverer than them and know what they're doing. Mm. But on the other hand, we've also seen over the past few years a, kind, a narrative which is trying to tell us not to trust educated people. It's now becoming, you know, it's the Michael Gove, we're tired of experts. The whole Brexit drama mm. is basically steeped in mm. these experts don't have your best interests at heart. Mm. I don't know how, I don't know if you can answer this, but how do they tally that? How do they have Latin speaking Johnson being, you know, hailed as the perfect leader, but educated civil servants are the left-wing cabal? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's sort of like 3D chess, isn't it? Yeah. It's like, you know, the mind explosion, like how does that exactly happen? I think that, you know, they're really helped by, you know, the, 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 they're really helped by the media, they're really helped by the media ecosystem and the sort of nature of public discourse in this country in that, you know, you don't see the front page of, you know, shall we say, helpful newspapers from their point of view and doing the sums and saying, you know, oh, two plus two actually doesn't equal five. You know, they can make these contradictory arguments and they will be carried to the population at large with, you know, a good body of support in the press to back them up on that. I mean, you just have to look at Partygate versus Currygate, mm -hmm. like Keir Starmer, and that whole, you know, essentially borderline fabricated story about him breaking lockdown rules, you know, it was shown that he'd done nothing wrong. That made it to the front page of, you know, the biggest national titles in this country. And pages and On pages. Daily, exactly, yeah. Yeah, it was sort of like, page 12, let's dissect what Keir Starmer had to eat on that fateful night. Yeah. You know, what was he having with his Pashwari naan? It was just like, it was just ludicrous. And then Johnson's misdeeds, for which he was actually, you know, fined for, were barely there uh, in lots of these publications. And so I think that allows them to sort of paper over the cracks of these, of these inconsistencies, like you say. And this is because of a, what you call a compliant press. A press that... Actually, let's talk about the lobby, because the lobby is fascinating mm. to me. As a disclaimer, I am a member of the lobby, <laughs> but I'm, I wouldn't say I was a hack. Yeah. And a hack is someone who haunts Westminster and picks up little tidbits and gossip mm. and they report that and they are supposedly neutral. But in order to be in that position, you have to be cosy with certain MPs and you have to have this friendship. Mm. And your argument would be that that can kind of blur the line, well, blur the truth and blur what you're reporting. Yeah. For sure. I mean, we've got the dual problem, like you say, on the one hand of the lobby and the whole lobby system, as you say, is, you know, for those who don't know, the lobby literally describes the area in Parliament where journalists are allowed to hang around so that they can pick up these sort of scraps of, uh, of gossip and whispers for, from MPs. So that is literally in the Palace of Westminster. Um, so the, the very nature of the lobby is built on access to power. And I think lots of journalists, particularly those who've been close to the Conservative Party, have sort of staked their reputations in the past 13 years on the level of their access to high power. Um, and because we haven't had a different government in charge, um, you know, if, if you're good mates with, say, Michael Gove, who's been at the cabinet table for a decent amount of that period, mm. you're going to get those scoops, you're going to get on the front page, you know, you're going to get a reputation in the lobby um, and that kind of you know in the nature of how the system's been built um, that allows for that like you say quite um, yeah quite incestuous reputation to fester and particularly when you have the sort of culture that Westminster does which is basically just the drinking culture I think on the one hand you know it allows politicians to whisper into the ear of journalists and basically plant a story but it also gives the journalists such access to ministers and those in high office that they feel like, I guess, a bit nervous about calling them out because they see them every day yeah. and that would be incredibly uncomfortable to do so, which you can kind of understand from a human point of view. 
Um, and then on the other hand, you know, away from the lobby in terms of the wider media media ecosystem, you've essentially got you know the biggest the biggest press outlets in the country, and more importantly, those that are revered by the broadcasters, they are owned by a few oligarchs. So you've even got the plutocracy in the media itself. You know, you've got these people who have a vested interest in lower tax rates, in demonizing welfare claimants and asylum seekers. You've got them basically running the media and having a monopoly over the biggest publications in this country. And again, that is corrosive to democracy and it has allowed um, you know, the plutocrats in power to, have got, uh, to get away with so much. But what's the solution to that? I mean, you've got access for journalists and you would think that that would, that would seem like a perfectly reasonable solution to have MPs brushing shoulders with journalists. If you took that away, that would, be, that would have dire consequences. Mm. I mean, it, it, it feels quite unsolvable, actually. It does, it does. I mean, I'd say, like, uh, democratise the lobby in some ways, you know, open it out, you know, the, the way in which you have to apply for a lobby pass and, you know who's thought to be worthy of a pass. I think that needs to change. You know, you need to, you need to widen it out to a lot of different publications. I think as well, I think we need to normalize the system of actually specialist reporters being in the lobby. Yes. In a way that there isn't currently. I think that was a massive yes. problem during the pandemic was that we had political journalists asking the questions and not health specialists, you know, who really could have got to the, the heart of, of an issue. Um, and that would be, yeah, that would be a good change as well. I think that now a lot with industrial correspondence, I can't believe that there are, that's a real dying art, yeah. being a proper, you know, when we're, trade union, they dominate the, the news agenda at the moment, but there's hardly anyone in there who actually really understands the dispute. And it's very difficult to hold, you know, high office to account if you don't know the insides and out of negotiations. Yeah. But, you know, one organisation that did put a health reporter in there was the BBC during the pandemic. Hugh Pym, wasn't mm. it? He used to stand up quite a lot during the Downing Street briefings. Mm. Um, I suppose that lends itself to your argument that the BBC is the grown-up? Yeah, for sure. It's kind of like the anchor of, right. of like discourse. Like, um, I mean, it's incredible, the BBC's popularity. You look at the stats, and it is the most popular news website in the world by, like... Like the second most popular has half the amount of monthly views that the BBC does. Mm -hmm. That's how popular popular the BBC is, like worldwide. So it not not only anchors debate in the UK in terms of you know setting the tempo of public conversation. It does that in other countries as well. And you know there's a big argument about you know the the government gutting the World Service and how that's reduced our soft power abroad, which I think it certainly has. But I think the BBC essentially with its um, you know, rules on independence and neutrality allows us not to sway into the territory of like Fox News Kingdom. And there are plenty of people funding, you know, media ventures who would like it to be like Fox News. You know, we've only seen, we only need to see the amount of money that's been pumped into GB News to, to witness how they want to change the broadcasting landscape in this country. But equally with that, you know, with great power and great viewership comes great responsibility for the BBC. Um, and my big argument, you know, having, having used to, um, you know, been employed by the BBC as well, is that it needs to value the truth above balance. That is the job of journalists, is to get to the truth, to investigate. And to be fair, on Pincher, they did a really good job. The BBC essentially broke that story mm. in association with The Sun. Um, and the truth is not the midpoint between a fact and a lie. And that's what it has got wrong recently. It's kind of been like, oh, Brexit, there are these thousand academics who say that Brexit is bad, but we're going to put one of them against the one academic who says that Brexit's good. And that mm -hmm. creates a false equivalence in the, in the mind of the nation. And I think when you know, the BBC is viewed so widely and you know, it does have that, I mean, you only had to look at uh, you know, the Queen's death last year to see how much of a hold the BBC has on, on public life. You know, it's got to see itself, its national duty as the truth and not this, you know, weird political balancing act. We've talked about Bullingdon, we've talked about these small little circles and the influences of power, but the biggest influence on Whitehall and Westminster is Tufton Street. Mm. And what is that exactly? 
So Tufton Street is a, is a street in Westminster um, that is lined by libertarian think tanks. So that may be confusing. Both of those things may be confusing. Libertarian essentially means believing in the free market in a small state, in fewer regulations, in lower taxes. And I think Tank is essentially an organization that puts out you know, reports on certain key um, policy issues. Um, and yeah, like you say, these libertarian free market think tanks that have lined Tufton Street have been have had an outsized influence on government policy, uh, certainly on Liz Truss's administration. Um, and look how that turned out. Um, but yeah, they're notoriously um, opaque about the about who funds them. Um, so the you know the few nibs of information that we've managed to find out um, over the years suggests that it's sort of you know big corporate interests, really, you know, fossil fuel companies, big tobacco, actually, um, in more distant memory, but um, certainly, you know, influential at one point in time. Um, and essentially, yeah, the, as I say in the book, Tufton Street um, and these think tanks are a really key part of sort of like the production, the, the Bullingdon Club production line. So they've been paid by these corporate interests, by these um, plutocrats by the oligarchs of um, not just Britain but the world to basically take philosophies that would benefit those people and advocate for them in Parliament and to say to MPs, you know, we should do, we should, we should, we should lower this tax and you know it would have a tremendous effect on the productivity of the nation. And politicians, politicians as they are, with you know a, a lack of actual public policy expertise hugely busy people, they, if they're presented with this sort of ready-made policy, and it kind of chimes with their ideological instincts, they're going to swallow it. And the Conservative Party has. You know, they've swallowed this really quite radical right-wing belief in the free market, you know, scrap bankers' bonuses, um, slash the top rate of tax, as we saw. Um, and it's all theoretical. It's like, until trust, it had kind of been tested through austerity and failed miserably, and hundreds of thousands of people had died. Mm. And then it was tried again through Liz Truss, and what happened? It crashed the economy. So like, it just doesn't work. Essentially, what they're doing is paying for this fringe free market belief to be a mainstream opinion in Westminster and in the House of Commons. And in the media, importantly, as well, because these, these um, think tanks have a fantastic relationship with media outlets, and they have like all the contacts that they need. So pretty much from the, I'd say, the day that you become a political reporter, mm. your inbox suddenly becomes full of these press releases from companies like the Taxpayers Alliance and the IEA, and they're really easy to write up, and normally they've got a really nice catchy headline, mm. and they get in the paper yeah. almost instantly without really any rebuttal or questioning. And you experienced that, right? When you yeah, first yeah. became a when reporter. I was, yeah, exactly the same as you. When I was a young reporter, I went in for a trial shift at a, you know, a pretty neutral um, political website that's that's well known in in the Westminster Village, and we got sent a press release from the Taxpayers Alliance, which is one of these uh, Tufton Street think tanks that was calling out a major rail infrastructure project and saying that it was a you know a massive waste of money, etc., um, which it you know very well might have been. But I was instructed by the editor who was running the trial shift to just write up that press release as a news story. Um, and yeah, they have been incredibly savvy at getting their message out, both within Westminster and, like you say, in the media where people are looking for the next scoop, you know, within half an hour as the modern media environment, you know, operates. Um, they've used press officers who are very good on camera, who can easily drop what they're doing and go on the BBC. And again, like, this is a, a main way in which the BBC needs to get its act together. It mm. needs to realise that these people are, for one, not representative of the country at, la at large. If you actually poll people on whether they like this sort of free market hysteria, they don't. And, you know, it's paid for. It's paid for lobbying effectively. And you're putting them on a panel alongside, like, politicians and, like, journalists and, you know, renowned people. And it's like... No, like, why aren't we questioning who we put on 
like who we feed to the nation because yeah. that's essentially what we are we're feeding their ideas to the nation and the BBC's been played by Tufton Street I mean, it continues to be played even after the, trush, the, the Liz Trust crash I thought well this is the end Tufton Street's a goner you know they're not going to get booked anymore and then within like a fortnight you see them everywhere popping back up you know different faces same organisation and you're just oh, you know your head's in your hands you think what more do we need to do to, you know, show that these guys, uh, yeah, are only in it for themselves? One thing that really bothers me about this, and you don't need to comment on this, but I will make the comment. Um, it always, or a lot of the time, it actually seems to be young, attractive women. And I find that really bothersome. That really grates on me because it'll be young women. Journalism is difficult for young girls trying to get in and they're offered this opportunity we're going to put you on camera we're going to let you uh, experience journalism and actually they're just there to spout out the harsh and vile theories of their big pocket owners anyway that's my, my two cents on that you could look to if you'd like any more further <laughs> evidence of that um, I think maybe we should wrap it up there I could talk to you all day maybe you have to come back uh, no I would love to yeah, yeah well Sam thank you very much Pleasure.